All right, is this okay? Okay, yeah, that's right. To start, I'm going to speak to the kind of workers and who is the part of the Perfect. Thank you. Uh, first off, I just wanted to thank uh, Alexi, Andreas, and Igor for putting together such an excellent workshop. I've really enjoyed all of the talks, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here and, and get to know many of you. Um, so I come from the uh, kind of more bootstrap side of things, but uh, for a while now, I've been working um, on kind of developing kind of a general method or a general framework for trying to use data that we can get from fixed points, so the sort of things that we can obtain with the conformal bootstrap, and try to figure out how to use that data to study deformations of conformal field theories and apply it to more general like quantum field theories. And so this work has been done uh, with uh, various linear combinations of uh, great collaborators. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give a particular shout out uh, to my junior collaborators, Yuan Sin, uh, who's here um, at uh, and is uh, currently a postdoc at Yale and will be moving to Carnegie Mellon in the fall. Brian Henning, uh, who's a postdoc at EPFL and will be moving to Santa Barbara in the fall. And then uh, Jed Thompson, uh, who actually just defended his thesis at Stanford and will be moving to a postdoc at um, Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland. And so kind of to be maximally ambitious, uh, the kind of goal, the long term overarching goal that we have is we really want to try to develop a general method or a general framework that we can use to really compute dynamical observables. We really want to study real time physics. So everything here is going to be formulated directly in Lorentzian signature. And uh, we want to be able to apply this method in general, strongly coupled QFTs. And so really, I want to, you know, I, the, the goal would be to where you name a theory and you name an observable, and we want to try to figure out kind of how to compute it. And so, uh, like, we don't just want to talk about the spectrum, we really want to talk about quantities like the wave functions, so like parton distribution functions, or uh, time dependent correlation functions, both in the vacuum, um, or excited states, but also at finite temperature or finite density. Um, things like scattering amplitudes, or you name it. So you tell me kind of what you would like to, to see, and, and I, like, I, I, I would like to push towards um, having the framework kind of this well oiled to where we could really try to shoot for this um, over the long term. So kind of, you know, to be uh, completely honest, kind of my big dream or my goal is to try to compute something like E plus E minus. So to really try to compute uh, something like this that um, is clearly inherently non-perturbative, very dynamical, um, and I try to compute this kind of from, from first principles. So this is uh, the goal. Yes. <laughs> no, good. So, so good. So, I, th I think that I think that kind of this goal is very complementary to the lattice. Like, I think that I think that the sort of observables that we're kind of naturally able to target are precisely those where the lattice has difficulty, and 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 vice versa. So, I, I think I think this is viewed as a very nice uh, kind of complement in our arsenal, uh, another tool uh, in our arsenal. Okay, so good. So we're very clearly not there yet, uh, but uh, I think we've made some like very exciting, very concrete kind of first steps. And so um, given the audience today, I'm kind of going to give more of an overview, but I'm happy to discuss offline kind of more details, both about the method or particular observables or theories that we've studied so far and, and kind of where we're going. So here are kind of two concrete examples just to give you a flavor of uh, the sorts of things we've been thinking about. So for example, in the two plus one D O N model, um, we've uh, computed the total cross section, for example, um, as a function of the center of mass energy. And so here we're looking at the large n limits, but still at finite coupling. So this is an inherently non-perturbative calculation. And what's nice about the large n limit is just that we have something to compare to. So we can really kind of test the method. And so we can resum the set of vacuum uh, bubble diagrams, and that gives us the magenta line, which is kind of the theory prediction. 
And then we can use uh, the method I'm about to tell you about uh, for computing this numerically. And we see that we agree to within kind of percent level accuracy. And this is with minimal effort. So this is um, a basis, which I'll explain what this means in just a second. But basically, I have to diagonalize a 6,000 by 6,000 uh, matrix. Um, and the construction and diagonalization of which takes roughly the order of 10 seconds. And this is computed on a laptop in Mathematica. Um, but the advantage is that the method that I'm going to describe doesn't rely on large n at any point. Um, so we can also do this at finite n, and actually we're pushing to do this right now to try to study, say, 1 plus 1d and 2 plus 1d phi to the fourth, or more generally, on models, um, and push beyond that. Um, but not just uh, we're not just looking at scattering; we're looking at other things, like, for example, the survival probability. So just kind of the evolution of some state. So if I prepare some, say, initial wave function, and then I evolve it in time, kind of what's the probability um, of measuring the same state at some later time. And so here I'm looking at the one plus one D phi to the fourth theory. And what I've done is I've taken kind of a random state with some energy density, with some kind of expectation of the Hamiltonian. Um, I've chosen of the order, like roughly 20 states, 20 randomly selected states, and then just kind of evaluate their evolution in time and then average them. And what we find is that those uh, results are in excellent agreement with kind of predictions of random matrix theory. So this is kind of a very analogous type structure to the spectral form factor, something that's been studied a lot in kind of chaotic systems uh, recently. And it's got kind of the same similar dip ramp plateau, just the dip is a bit kind of more shallow. Um, but uh, so here we're able to see that um, we're really accurately producing um, kind of the evolution of states um, for even very high energy uh, states as well. And so this was a little bit more computationally intensive, but still we're talking computations on the order of an hour on a laptop. So I really want to stress we are not sophisticated numerical people. So I think there's a lot of room to grow in this direction, but right now kind of our focus has been on kind of just more conceptual questions and trying to understand the method of how do I use conformal field theory data to generate plots like this in more general theories. And so how are we doing this? Uh, so the kind of approach I'm going to describe has the incredibly catchy name of conformal truncation. And the basic idea is the following. We kind of rely on this modern picture of quantum field theory as renormalization group flows between fixed points. And so if I take a generic theory, most theories systems that I care about have some finite set of mass scales, um, say like lambda QCD or things like this. And if I go to very short to very long distances, so I go far away from these mass scales, the system typically becomes scale invariant and approaches some fixed point. And so for example, if I go to very short distances, I can describe my quantum field theory as coming from some UV fixed point, some short distance conformal field theory. And this picture is very suggestive somehow, all of the physics contained along this RG flow must somehow be buried within the UV fixed point. Somehow nature knows, given some initial starting point, what's going to happen all along the flow. And so the question is basically, is there a way for us to extract kind of some subset of the IR information from this UV data? And so the kind of input that I'm, that I'm going to be using is the natural kind of data of the conformal field theory. So things like scaling dimensions of local operators or operator product expansion coefficients kind of connecting them together, describing the dynamics. So this is going to be the input. And then the goal is to try to obtain kind of physics that most people care about, things like the spectrum of bound states or things like correlation functions, time dependent correlation functions or scattering amplitudes or you name it. Or to kind of say things more simply, conformal truncation is just a uh, means of laundering results from one Simon's collaboration to another. So, great, this is all well and good, but how do we do this? Like, this is a very suggestive picture of CFTs somehow no information about more general quantum field theories, but how can we extract this data? And so kind of the approach we're gonna take is a very old fashioned one in some sense, kind of the most naive one, which is that if you wanna study dynamics in a quantum mechanical world, that just means diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. So the generator of time translations is the operator that controls the dynamics. And if you take a very bright undergrad who hasn't yet take, taken QFT and you try to describe it to them, they would exactly say like, okay, great. I have some new degrees of freedom. I have Lorentz invariance, but you know, solving a theory means diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. But of course, the moment you take a QFT class, you're immediately told, forget all about Hamiltonians. We're never gonna do it, talk about that ever again. And the reason is very simple, right? At weak coupling, diagonalizing the Hamiltonian is incredibly impractical. If you even take a free massive theory and shift the mass, you have to resum an infinite set of contributions. And just doing old fashioned perturbation theory is, is very impractical. And we reorganize calculations in a way that makes Lorentz invariance manifest. And that leads to Feynman diagrams. 
And at strong coupling, this is impossible. I have a continuously infinite Hilbert space. I have no idea how to even begin thinking about diagonalizing this Hamiltonian. Yes. Good. Good, but okay, good, 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 good. But in a QFT, like in a, in, a, in, a, in a lattice system, yes, I can I can try to do something like this of diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. But I'm saying in a quantum, in an infinite volume continuum quantum field theory, I have no idea how to do this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be a bit less ambitious and we're just going to say, okay, fine, let's diagonalize part of the Hamiltonian. And so the kind of basic picture um, is this kind of general method known as Hamiltonian truncation. And it's a very old idea um, in non relativistic quantum mechanics called the Raleigh Ritz method. And it's a method for approximating the low energy eigenstates of a Hamiltonian. And the idea is incredibly simple. So there's basically just three steps. One, in the example of a QFT, where you have kind of a continuous Hilbert space, you need some way of discretizing it. I want to put this on a computer. And so I need some way of having a discrete set of uh, basis states, of energy eigenstates. And so the kind of typical way people discretize this is to say, put uh, go to finite volume. Um, but any sort of kind of discretization is going to work. We're going to talk about something different in our, uh, in the method I'm going to present today. Um, then once you have a discrete Hilbert space, then what you do is you truncate. So you just say, I'm going to restrict myself to some finite dimensional subspace of this full infinite dimensional Hilbert. And so if you look at the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is some infinite dimensional matrix. And so we're just going to restrict ourselves to some finite dimensional subspace, evaluate the Hamiltonian within that subspace, and then forget about everybody else pretend that this finite dimensional matrix is the Hamiltonian and diagonalize it. And then the point, the idea is that the eigenstates of this kind of truncated matrix are an approximation to the energy eigenstates of the true full uh, infinite dimensional Hamiltonian. And so the kind of basic idea, the kind of way you formulate this approach is you take your Hamiltonian, you split it up into two parts, a solvable piece H naught, and then a deformation V. And though even though this looks insanely perturbative, this looks very reminiscent of perturbation theory, I'm, this, I'm not assuming that V is a small perturbation. The reason I'm splitting it up this way is that H naught gives me a basis that I can use to compute the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. I just need some theory where I know how to compute the matrix elements that go into this. And then once I have the matrix elements, I forget all about H naught and then I just diagonalize, okay? So what's nice about kind of this Hamiltonian truncation type method is it just kind of rephrases the question to what's a good basis. So in other words, where do low energy eigenstates live within the Hilbert space? Like what's a good subset of the Hilbert space that I can restrict myself to that will efficiently kind of capture low energy. And there are various methods that you can do. Uh, this is a very old idea. Like where um, there was a lot of pioneering work kind of in the eighties uh, in taking the guys of like DLCQ or the truncated conformal space approach. And then there's been kind of a nice resurgence of interest in this um, in using various uh, choices of basis, choices of discretization, things like this. So the one I'm going to present today, um, it kind of takes the CFT picture or this fixed point picture maximally seriously and says, okay, great. I'm going to think of my QFT as some conformal field theory plus some deformation, some, you know, some set of relevant operators. And so I'm just going to use kind of the natural basis from this, U, from this UV fixed point. So that's going to be the basis that I use. And so going through the checklist of general truncation methods. So first we have to discretize. And so we're going to use the CFT basis of local operators. That's kind of the natural object in a conformal field theory. And so the kind of spectrum of operators is discrete. But for each operator, we have a continuum of states. So what we're going to do is we're interested in systems that uh, preserve translation invariance. And so to kind of make maximal use of this, we're going to go to Fourier um, to momentum space. And so we can think of these objects as kind of CFT partial waves. So it's a continuous family of energy eigenstates labeled by individual local operators in the conformal field theory, which are labeled by their scaling dimensions and whatever other quantum numbers. And so to make this basis discrete, we need to, for each operator O, discretize kind of the continuous range of energy states that we get out. What we're going to do is we're going to discretize them into just discrete bins, but you could choose whatever discretization you want. Um, and so then we have a discrete basis, discrete set of operators for each operator. We have a discrete set of kind of energy eigenstates where we just discretize this parameter uh, E in the Fourier transform. Then we need to truncate. And to truncate, we're going to do two things. 
One, we're going to restrict ourselves to a finite number of operators. So we're specifically going to keep operators with low scaling dimension. So we're going to set some threshold, some cutoff delta max, and only keep states below that. And then for each operator, we keep a finite number of energy bins. Then once we have that basis, we can construct the Hamiltonian from the conformal field theory data. So the Hamiltonian matrix elements look like this. The Hamiltonian is just an integral of a local operator. It's just the deformations that I'm adding to my CFD. My basis states are built from local operators. So this is nothing other than just a conformal field theory three-point function, which is completely fixed by the scaling dimensions and OP coefficients of the CFT, which is exactly the data that we get from the bootstrap. Yes? So good. Because I mean, your type is not by delta, right? So then you're writing not Hamiltonian, but no, no, good. Okay, good. So I want to be I want to be maximally clear. So so what we're going to do is we're going to our states are defined on the plane. So we're not we're not working on the cylinder. And so our Hamiltonian that we're going to diagonalize is really the generator of time translations, not the dilatation operators. We're just organizing kind of our basis. We're keeping them by kind of conformal Casimir eigenstates. Like that's what we are. We're using dilatation. We're using no, no. Well, maybe I'm not understanding your your question, <laughs> but uh, but just just to stress, the operator we're going to diagonalize at the end of the day is just the Hamiltonian. We're using kind of eigenstates of the dilatation operator as a way of kind of organizing our basis. If if that's like if that makes sense. Okay, good. So then we you know given a CFC. So I'm going to take that as my given input. I you know, want to consider a particular deformation. I construct my basis. I construct the Hamiltonian. And then I diagonalize. And what do the results look like? Well, the first thing I get is I get kind of the mass spectrum, just the spectrum of mass eigenvalues. And so in the true continuum QFT, I expect something like this. I have the ground state, the vacuum. I might have one or more excited, like bound states. And then I have kind of the multi-particle continuum. What our data is going to look like, because we've discretized the kind of Hilbert space and use a finite uh, um, uh, size basis, we still, we're still we still going to find the ground state, we're still going to find some approximations of the excited states, and then we're going to have some dense discrete spectrum of states corresponding to multi-particle states. How do I actually evaluate them? So, the, yeah. That's right, exactly. So, the, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, good, 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 good. So yeah, so for a generic, so depending on the scaling dimension of your relevant operator, there will be IR divergences. And what you'll find is the following, is that um, when you, so let's say I just put in some IR regulator for now. So I, I have some, you know, functional momenta that, that diverges with the, with the IR regulator. And then as I take the regulator to uh, like my R to infinity or epsilon to zero, however you want to say it, what I find is that in the Hilbert space, like in the eigenstates, some fraction of the states will diverge and some fraction of the states will um, be finite. And so basically what these IR divergences do is they just kind of tell you that some part of the CFT Hilbert space gets lifted out and has no overlap with kind of low energy states. And so in practice, so you can do this one of two ways. One, you can do it exactly how we did it the first way, which was just naively of doing exactly this and watching the states get lifted out. And then you realize that actually the states that are left over at low energies are just kind of the kernel of kind of the divergent piece of this, which is completely fixed by conformal invariance. And so you can just restrict yourself to that kernel from the beginning. But you're absolutely right. Generically, if the operator is, uh, uh, has a scaling dimension that's um, too low, uh, then you'll have divergences, but, but that we understand like how, what effect that has on the resulting uh, eigenstates. But that's a very good point. Hmm? Yeah, good. I mean, so one thing I can say, uh, one thing I can say is that kind of the convergence of this basis is precisely uh, like uh, motivated by convergence of the OPE that very roughly in this matrix. So, you know, what determines convergence of this, right? It's the off diagonal elements mixing what you kept with what you threw away. And um, what are the states here? So what are these matrix elements? They're matrix elements between very high dimension and very low dimension operators due to your deformation, which is also a low dimension operator. And so these are kind of low, low, high, which are exactly the ones that are suppressed to guarantee convergence of the OPE. Yeah, yeah. 
so yeah, so good. So I was not planning on talking about this, but uh, but yeah. So so in practice, so what we do is obviously to define a basis, I have to choose a quantization scheme. Um, in practice, what we've been doing for the most part is working in uh, in light front quantization, but that's not uh, crucial to like you can formulate everything I'm saying also in equal time. And in fact, we're pushing on doing exactly this to kind of see the comparisons. Now, light cone seems to have a great many number of advantages, especially if you want to study infinite volume observables. Uh, Things like the S matrix or stuff like that, but it's not it's not crucial. Um, but yeah. No, no, I'm not I'm not relying on perturbation theory at all. Yeah. Yeah. This is so basically what you're doing is is the so 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 every example I'm going to show you today is exactly one where the UV is free, um, just because those are fixed points where we have the most data uh, to compute to, to put in as an input. Um, so basically, what you're doing is you're not doing perturbation theory. What you're doing is if your UV is is well, it doesn't matter if your UV is free, but it's easiest to understand. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're resumming an infinite set of diagrams. So if I look at like the set of diagrams, I'm kind of resumming an infinite set of like subset. Of those diagrams, where I basically just say, like, I'm only going to keep a finite set of intermediate states within these diagrams, but I'm going to resum them to all orders, if that makes sense. So if I took kind of the normal, like, you know, Feynman or old fashioned perturbations, like whatever thing I want, and I'm only going to keep a finite set of intermediate states, but I'm going to keep their contributions to all orders in the coupling. So it's very fundamentally different from conformal, uh, from, from perturbation theory. And the, the non-perturbative thing is just coming from the fact that I'm exact, I'm diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. Uh, like it's that numerical diagonalization that's doing kind of this resumming to all orders, if that makes sense. Ah, good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. So so this is one reason uh, why we've been working in, in light front quantization is kind of, kind of to simplify some of the detailed structure associated with the vacuum or to, not simplify, but to, to shove it aside. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so what's going to happen in terms of the convergence is you're absolutely right. There's kind of two pieces that you have to, uh, which this is true in any uh, uh, Hamiltonian kind of method, like um, your basis, you're using your basis to reproduce two things, right? One, you're trying to reproduce the vacuum of the new, like of the deformed theory, as well as whatever excitations are on top of it. Um, and so what's been nice about kind of focusing on kind of light front quantization is um, kind of skirting the former to kind of focus on the excitations, but but uh, you're absolutely right that different choices of basis could be more or less kind of convert uh, um, efficient for trying to reproduce both the ground state or the excited states. And I do want to stress like what I, like kind of the main message I want to take home from this is not that this conformal basis is the best possible thing you could be doing. It just seems like a generally kind of robust organizing procedure for the Hilbert space. I guarantee you that there are better choices of bases for particular theories or particularly observables. And I think this is a question that's worth exploring more generally. OK. So to summarize, uh, the basic structure is kind of the inputs are two and three point functions from a CFC. So if I take those as a given, for example, for free theory, but more generally, um, if I use the bootstrap or whatever to kind of compute this data, that becomes my input. I then just truncate the spectrum of operators to some finite uh, um, delta max, diagonalize the truncated Hamiltonian, and then my output is both the eigenvalues, but also the eigenstates, which I can then use to compute things like correlation functions or scattering amplitudes. And so this is kind of a general recipe for using short distance data to get long distance physics. And so we've, for the past few years, basically been applying this to various systems to kind of see how it does. And so mostly we've been focusing on systems in one plus one and two plus one dimensions. Um, and so here's just kind of a very quick, probably overwhelming uh, highlight reel. Um, but like, for example, we can look at things that like correlation functions near a critical point. So here we're looking at the two plus one D phi to the fourth theory. And for a critical value of the coupling, the gap closes and this flows to a fixed point in the same universality class as the 3D easing model. And so what we can do is we can look at correlation functions near this critical point. And we can see that it sh at uh, short distances, say phi squared, phi to the fourth, and phi to the sixth, look very different. In the UV, there are very different operators. But then at long distances, they all flow to the same operator, the lowest dimension Z2 uh, even operator in the easing model, which is epsilon. And so we get this kind of universal behavior, and we can match uh, this to the scaling dimension of, the, of epsilon in the, in the 3D easing model. 
Um, but we can't, we don't just have to do position dependent correlation functions. We can do more general time dependent by looking at, say, spec Chow and Lehman spectral densities. And so if we have, say, unstable states, like in Yukawa theory, we can uh, measure kind of bright Wigner peaks. Um, we can also compute uh, part-time distribution functions. Uh, this plot was very generously uh, generated by Juan a couple hours ago. Um, and uh, I wanted to just kind of uh, reply to Varun's uh, talk yesterday that I think we can, we can compute these part-time distribution functions, say, not just for mesons, but also for baryons in 1 plus 1 DQCD. Um, uh, we can also measure, say, renormalization group flows by computing the zomologic of C function. And so here we're taking a particular theory that in the IR flows to the easing model and we can read off the central charge. We can also study not just kind of ground state, uh, not just vacuum correlation functions, but we can also look at um, correlation functions in excited states. And so here in fight of the fourth theory, we're looking at say the expectation value of operators like D squared phi squared or D phi to the fourth in high energy states. And what we see is that uh, they're actually, one, we find kind of agreement with ETH that these expectation values are just smooth functions of kind of the expectation value of energy. And not only that, but they're agreeing with their kind of uh, finite temperature predictions. And so in this example, at high temperatures, uh, these two operators, um, the, the thermal prediction from the CFT is that their expectation values should be exactly the same with some coefficients that I'm absorbing right now. And we find that at high temperatures, they exactly agree. And even the deviations um, exactly match kind of the expectation you would get from just like perturbation theory at high temperatures. And we can compute scattering amplitudes as well. So we've been exploring a whole host of uh, different kind of observables and theories, but this is a workshop. Oh, yep. Yes, so yeah, so this is, so this is SU3. So good, so, so what I'm, oh yeah, good, 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 good. So here I'm looking at, yeah, yeah great, 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 great. So yeah, let's be hyper concrete. So this is, which Yuan, this is from his work, so he sh should correct me if I say anything incorrect, but so this is um, SU3 QCD with a, with a single flavor, um, but you could do it for more general flavors as well. Um, and so here, what I'm looking at is uh, the, the lowest uh, meson. And there we find that the basis, sorry, the wave function is overwhelmingly dominated by two parton states, even at finite coupling. If you go to higher states, then they have a large contribution from uh, higher, part, uh, higher parton states as well. Um, and so you'll get more complicated uh, structure, but it just so happens that this lowest one um, is very well approximated by uh, two particle states. But we're, not, but we're not making that approximation. We're keeping all particle states up to whatever truncation and delta max we keep. So in this particular, okay, good. Uh, I, I definitely agree with, um, let me think about this. So for this particular model, um, for, the, for the lowest guy, you can see that uh, there's actually a nice kind of prediction of kind of what the fall off should be uh, near X equals zero um, from a tuft. Uh, and uh, what we can see is that um, even as you add higher, particle number, like even as you vary the truncation, this seems like a pretty robust that this, this, this prediction for kind of the behavior near um, X equals zero. Now I'm not an expert on 2D QCD, so it'd be good to talk about like, you know, what features or if, or if I look at more like higher um, excited meson states, kind of if the features look roughly different, but, uh, um, but we only just started as of a couple hours ago, exploring these PDFs in detail. So, uh, so but it, this is a good question of kind of what features we should be looking for and things like this. Okay, great. But the obvious elephant in the room is, okay, but I would like to use this method to study, say, 4D QCD or more general gauge theories in 2 plus 1 and 3 plus 1 dimensions. And so there are kind of two different ways that you could envision using this sort of method for studying something like QCD. And the most obvious one, the most kind of like human readable uh, way of thinking about it would be, okay, great. Let's take a theory of free quarks and gluons. And then our deformation is going to be, you know, gauge and like the gauge interactions. And then we'll flow to QCD. But from a conformal field theory point of view, this is an insane thing to do. This doesn't make any sense. These are not gauge invariant local operators. The only reason the Hamiltonian is gauge invariant is because you've integrated this over all of space. And if and so if you add any sort of you know um, any sort of regulator, any sort of uh, cutoff, then this generically is going to wreak havoc on gauge invariance. And and uh, this is exactly the kind of general problem of studying QCD. 
But an alternative path that makes much more sense from a conformal field theory point of view is to start from some interacting fixed point. And this fixed point could even be weakly coupled and in fact should be weakly coupled because I want to have, well, okay, first let's just talk about the picture and then I'll argue. Um, so for example, if I take say a Banks-Sachs fixed point, so let's be maximally concrete. So I'm gonna be in 4D, I wanna study SU3. And if I take say 16 flavors, alpha star is roughly 0.04. So this is a very weakly coupled theory. Then what I could do is I can compute the spectrum of scaling dimensions and the OPE coefficients, either just perturbatively or via the bootstrap or some combination. And then the deformation I'm gonna add is just a mass term for all of the matter I don't want. So I can add, give gap out all but say three of the species of, of quarks. And this will generate an RG flow also leading to QCD. And precisely because I want a separation, I don't want the kind of confinement scale to be close to this gap, to this mass scale. I specifically want uh, my UV theory to be perturbative exactly where I can kind of compute the data efficiently. And so this has the advantage of I'm adding kind of a relevant deformation. It's inherently gauge invariant. There's no subtleties with cutoffs. And um, I think this is, and we're currently working to compute this data to try to study something like this, um, either in 3D or 4D. And I wanna stress that this kind of secondary approach works for any gauge theory. You name a gauge theory and we can just add matter in whatever representations until we find a weakly coupled fixed point. And this includes say chiral gauge theories. And so this is kind of a general recipe of using CFD data and trying to study non-perturbatively uh, gauge theories. Yes. Good, I, so that's a good question. Um, at the moment, at the moment, I don't see how to do that, but that's a good question. In the sense that like right now we're being very operational of just like my basis, I specify some number in F, I construct all operators out of this. Now, now you can like study things kind of, you know, one over NF expansion, for example. But, but, but yeah, if you really wanted to study this at say NF equals 15 and a half or something like that, like, that's a good question. I, I don't immediately know offhand how you would formulate this. In principle, this might, this might be doable, but I haven't thought too carefully about it. It's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in principle, they should be. I like, um, the one thing I would worry about, and this is, this is purely because I haven't thought about it too carefully. Like I know that as you vary kind of continuous parameters, like, um, like it's not, I haven't thought too carefully about kind of the, the like, unitary or whatever the structure is of kind of these these systems at finite at, at like continuous nf for the same reason that if i could like continuous very very deep like i i just haven't thought about this now people in this room probably have and maybe you're right that we can construct this matrix as a continuous function of nf and try to study the behavior continuously that's a good question i don't see it but i but maybe yeah mm -hmm. yeah Ah, good. Okay, good, 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 good. So, so you're absolutely right. So, so one thing that we could think about is like, yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Um, if I'm understanding your question slash comment correctly, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So I definitely want uh, this theory to have a decent amount to flow for a, a decent amount. I want to have a decent amount of separation between the masses of the heavy guys that I added in purely to give me kind of a gauge invariant or like a, a fixed point in the UV um, and my confinement scale. And so you're absolutely right that at intermediate scales, these two ways will look very, sim very similarly. And so one thing we could try to do is we could try to like use this method as like this kind of framework as a way of kind of understanding how to, in a simple kind of gauge invariant way, like phrase, I agree. Like these extra matter that I'm adding is just a means to an end. Like it's kind of stupid. I add them, I use them to compute data and then I get rid of them. Um, and so it seems like there probably is some way of kind of phrasing the Hamiltonian without them, but this is kind of the most obvious way that I, or the most algorithmic way that I know how to do it, but it'd be interesting to try to learn more general lessons about how to never use this kind of stupid intermediate step. Yeah. 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 Yeah, good. I mean, so, so yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, I think what's, what's nice about doing this, or I think what's most compelling about doing this is that we have no choice but to learn something. 
we'll learn one of two things, right? We'll either, either learn that the kind of low dimension operators in this theory have large overlap or, or are sufficient for understanding confinement or that, or that it's very crucial that we have kind of high dimension information. Um, and so I think, I think both would be excellent. Obviously one I'd be happier, but, but I like, I think this is worth understanding just because it, it tells me information about kind of the structure of confinement or how confinement is embedded within kind of the UV fixed point. So, so in, so in practice, what we're doing, so that discretization is kind of, hidden but is not too hard to understand like um in this discretization of energy bins and so basically so what we're doing is so so here's what we do with the transverse directions so with i mean it's it's no different really so first we fix a total frame so we just say i'm going to work say in the transverse momentum equals zero then my basis will include operators that have like relative transverse uh derivatives but those are just additional operators that i can construct and so kind of the only discretization that I like that does most of the discretization for me and all I have left is kind of one that's just the energy for different operators built from different dimensions, uh, different uh, sets of transverse derivatives acting between say if I'm studying from a free field theory. Um, that's right yeah so. Yeah, so what's nice about this is that like uh, this seems to play kind of maximally well with kind of uh, Lorentz invariance or preserving as much of it as you can. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's worth thinking about other like setups beyond this. Um, and some have been explored. And I think I think this is a good like general question. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm definitely out of time. Uh, but the good news is I'm done. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of exciting directions, I think, to pursue um, the kind of most uh, uh, Pressing or the one I'm most excited about is uh, starting from interacting fixed points. So either computing bank stacks data perturbatively or using things like n equals four super Yang mills to study flows to gauge theories. So to say get pure Yang mills from pure Yang mills in the planar limit from say n equals four data um, to kind of generalize or kind of expand this this computation of the S matrix elements to try to study things like bound states, resonances, the kind of full discontinuity structure of the of the um, S matrix to study finite temperature dynamics. Here I showed you one point functions, but going to higher point functions, we could study hydrodynamics, see like propagation of sound modes uh, to kind of study systems at finite chemical potential, compute energy correlation functions, you name it. And so I think kind of as we are pushing, I, I think this is a perfect audience to kind of, you know, tell us what we should do or what we should think about. So thank you for your time. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, great. No, this is a very good point. I think like uh, definitely as we push, I mean, at, at each stage, because, you know, we're developing a new method and really trying to follow our nose and see how well it works and what circumstances is efficient. I think it's useful for us to have sanity checks or things like this that we can compare against. And I think that's a very good point for as we push to gauge theories. Yeah, I agree. Right, yeah. So good. So um, I will be maximally honest. Uh, I do not fully understand functional renormalization group, especially I do not understand kind of the the systematics or the sizes of corrections, which I mean, maybe they do. I, like this is a pure statement of ignorance on my part. Um, what's nice about this is that like here we have a very kind of a very concrete understanding of uh, our systematics and the, and the effects of these higher dimension operators precisely because they're just controlled by kind of these off diagonal matrix elements. And those are just controlled by kind of the large delta behavior of OP coefficients, which we have very detailed information about kind of their asymptotics. And we can really understand the size of these corrections and the rate of convergence of our, of our, uh, 
of our results as we vary delta max. Now, I don't know, yeah, go ahead. I mean, good. So, like, uh, so yeah. So, so you're asking exactly the right question. Like, uh, I think. So, I'll, I'll say two things. One, definitely, we don't like if we if we say go through a phase transition or things or things like this. Like, we currently do not have an under like any sort of rigorous understanding of kind of our of our of our errors. What we've found so far is that the kind of observational results agree with the kind of convergence that you would find the kind of naive convergence, but. But I agree that this is something that I personally would like to understand much better and, and much more much more uh, rigorously. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, so good. So yeah, what you would, I mean. Yeah, exactly. So like very roughly, very roughly, here's, here's what I would, I would hope to find. But again, like this is, we haven't done this. So, so like, this is my hope, but, or what I would hope to see. So what I would expect is basically the following is that um, as I like uh, very, the um as i vary the number of flavors that i gap out what i would expect to find is say like let's say you know i start i start with this, six, this theory with 16 and and i and i gap out like a single flavor or something like that what i expect to see is some flow and that the gap like that uh as i vary my truncation as i add more and more states to my basis that just my gap continually closes that i see that i'm still in a fixed point Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but then, but then the expectation would be that as I increase the number of, as I, as I gap out more and more flavors, that I would then see that there's kind of this transition from I have, and perhaps the convergence will get slower with like Delta Max, but I should see that once I'm outside of the conformal window, once I've gapped out enough, that really like kind of the lowest eigenstate is robust, that as I increase the truncation, he's no longer varying that he's hitting some wall, um, which is the, which is the confinement scale. And then I should also see kind of roughly, like I have a prediction of roughly where I expect this scale to be um, set by the, the coupling of the, of the UV fixed point. Yeah, so good, so absolutely. So like, um, so one thing you can do, so like, for example, um, like one, one simple thing we could do is, there's, there's, I mean, there's probably more efficient ways of doing this, but like, one thing we can do is we can look at say like correlation functions or something like this. And so we could, we could see exactly this. So what we would see is we would see that like, let's say I went from 16 to 15 flavors or something like that. And so if I look at say psi bar psi or whatever name an operator that you want to study with like some particular quantum numbers, I'll see that in the UV, it'll have some power law behavior. And then in the IR that this will transition to some other uh, behavior. And I can read off the anomalous dimensions there. It's possible there's more efficient ways of doing it than that, but that's kind of the most naive way that you could imagine 